relaunch, renew, restore, revive, refresh, recharge, reform, remake, restart, reset, revisit. Reactivate, remodel, revamp, recover, regroup, remind, regather, rebrand, re recommend, recommit, redefine, rededicate, reconsider, revise, reassess. No matter where you are, in life, no matter how desperate the situation may seem, no matter, far, no matter how far gone you may feel in your heart with Jesus, with Jesus, you can always, always make a new start. We are the church of the reformation, the reformation. And the reformation is all about new beginnings. And new beginnings are all about what? Hope. We have hope. You know, this world that we live in, there isn't much in terms of new starts. It's the same old, same old, over and over. History has a way of repeating itself. And there, there's, there's not much new. But with God's people, this is the day the Lord has made. His mercies are new each and every morning. Your past does not equal your present. Your past does not equal your future. Today is the day of salvation, and today is the day of a whole new beginning. The Reformation was the culmination of a new start for Martin Luther. Uh, some of you may be familiar with Martin Luther, Martin Luther was a monk who walked this earth some 500 years ago. Uh, in the year 2000, when we were uh, coming upon 2000, they, they marked who were the most influential people of the past millennium, and Martin Luther was typically right there at the top, one of the most influential people of that thousand-year thousand year period of history. Martin Luther lived, however, much of his life as a tortured soul. He was, was planning on being trained as a lawyer, but as with many people, God had different plans for Martin Luther than Martin Luther had for himself. One day while he was traveling by horseback, this tremendous storm came up. The, the trees started to blow. The limbs started coming down. Lightning struck. Boom! Close proximity to where he was. This disorients Luther. He fears for his life, and out of desperation, he cries out to St. Anne, save me. He makes a promise. He says, if you save my life, bargaining with God, we do that sometimes, right? I don't recommend that. But he bargains with God. He says, he says if you save me from this storm, I will become a monk. And true to his word, God, he's saved from this storm, and he becomes, he becomes a monk. As a monk... Luther excels in his study. He is ordained as a priest and later as a professor in theology. 
Luther's relationship with God, however. That's what I want to talk about. Luther did not know God as you and I have come to know God. Dwell on this. Luther became a monk without ever reading the Bible. You see, the Bible was not readily accessed in his day. Most people did not read, and let alone the Bible was only translated in Latin, and even fewer people read Latin. So all that a person knew about God was what they were told about God by someone else. They were not able to read or, or study the scriptures, the, the Bible that we have here, that likely you have read for yourself. They did not have that opportunity that we have. One of the keys to the Reformation, one of the things that Luther saw as very important, was to translate the Bible into the language of the people. And so there is Luther's German Bible that he, he translated to give many more people that ability to read the scriptures for themselves. It's a heritage. It's a legacy of the Reformation. And we're blessed today to have the English Bible. And it's not just one translation, but we have numerous, many translations of the Bible in our own language. And we want to pray, though, for those people groups. And there are still parts of the world. We have Lutheran Bible translators and, and other translator organizations that are attempting to put the Bible in the native language, in the native tongue of many people who are here in this, this world. Uh, the God Luther came to know, having been not read about God in the Bible, but what he was told about God was that God was a God to be feared. That God was a God of vengeance. That God was the righteous judge. In many ways, that God was the God who was out to get you. And you better watch how you step. You better watch what you do. Luther spent his life trying to escape the punishment of God, living in fear. He punished his body. He fasted. He made a pilgrimage to Rome. He prayed for forgiveness. He confessed his sin. He even made up sins to confess. Trying to cover all of his bases, thinking there might be something he didn't know about. So he just confessed sins for the sake of confessing sins. Luther needed change. Luther needed reformation. Luther needed a new start, a new start with God and a new start in his life. Luther starts to read the scriptures, the Bible, for himself. And he starts to discover something that this God that he was told about for all of these years is not necessarily the same God that is presented here in the word. His eyes are opened. He begins to see God in, in a new way. He starts to see God as a God of mercy. He starts to see God not as a God who is out to get him, but as a God who loves him. It didn't change all at once. October 31st, 1517, the eve of All Saints Day, that we've come to know as Halloween. Well, he nails the 95 theses, not the 95 Reeses, okay? I hope we get some of those tomorrow or tonight at Trunk or Treat, right? The 95 Reeses. I know Jacob loves Reeses. Ah. So he nails the 95 theses to the Wittenberg church door, which is marked as the birthday of the Reformation. But at that time, all of this is, Luther's wrestling with all of this in his mind, what he's been told, and how that contradicts with what he's just learned and what he's just read. It's a formative time in, in history. 
One of the scripture passages that opened Luther's mind and opened up his heart is the scripture reading that Sylvia read just a little while ago, Romans chapter chapter 3. Verse 19, it says, We know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law. That's Luther, that's you, and that's me before the realization of the gospel. So that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. The law spoke to Luther because, well, remember, he had been training and he had been studying to become a lawyer. And, and, and he recognized his accountability before God. Luther tried to justify himself before God, but no matter how much he tried, it never seemed to be enough. He never seemed to be able to do enough. And what this verse says, that there is a gap between us and God that is, is wider than we can grasp, wider than we can put our, our minds around, and we will never bridge that gap on our own by what we do. We all have the law. And when we have the law, our faith becomes a bunch of checkboxes. It becomes a bunch of obligations. And for many people in this world, their relationship with God, their relationship with church, it's all about obligation, things that I have to do. Do you ever feel that way? You know, when you're writing that check or typing on the computer or on your phone to give your offering, that, that, that you feel a tinge of obligation. This, I ha I'm supposed to do this. Coming to church on Sunday morning. We have this sense of burden. We have this sense of, of obligation. And that is the law weighing down upon us. We all have our check boxes. Baptism. Sunday school. Confirmation. Attend at church. Pray. Read my Bible. Tithe. Volunteer at Harvest Fest <laughs> on a committee. Do all the right things and then be right with God. And if I do all the right things, then God will reward me. That's the law. But the Reformation, the gospel, frees us from the burden of the law. For those of us who are in Christ, it is not a got to. It's not an obligation, but it is a get to, a, a privilege to serve the one who has saved us from our sin. It says here, uh, Romans chapter 3, verse 21, but now. That word but has a way of changing. There, there's one reality, but then it says, now here, there's a new reality, a different reality. But now, a righteousness, and that word righteousness, it's a big word, it's a theological word, but if you break it down, the essence of righteousness, it's, it's simply to be right with God, to be accepted by God, to be forgiven by God. A righteousness of God. And what that means there, that, that, that of is possessive. In other words, the righteousness is not possessed by you and by me, but rather that, that, that righteousness is possessed by God. God is the one who establishes righteousness, not by what we do for him, but what he has done for us. This righteousness of God has been manifested, manifested, Another, another big word. Romans is filled with big words. It means to show. It means to make known. It means to r reveal. And so here now, at this point in history today, God reveals for us a new righteousness, not a type of righteousness that the, that the world's used to ch chasing after, that the church is used to chasing after but a new righteousness that is, that is apart from the law, that is apart from obligation. 
And al- although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. So sometimes we, we think Old Testament, New Testament, and there's the Old Covenant. And the Old Testament is all about law, and the New Testament is, is all about the gospel. Uh, that's, that, that's not exactly the case. Because all of the Old Testament ultimately is his story. It's God's story, and it points us, it points us ultimately to Jesus. Even though Jesus isn't named in the Old Testament, all of the Old Testament points us to Jesus. It points us to what God has been up to since the beginning of time, working salvation for you and for me. It's been there all along. It goes on to say, There is no distinction, for all have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God. There is no distinction. It doesn't matter if you are a pastor. And sometimes I, I, I get that, that you, people will come to me and they want me to pray for them because, well, you know, Pastor, you're somehow closer to God, right? The reality is, is because of who I am, because of a title, uh, that doesn't make me any closer to God than, than you. It's not about you drawing near to God, but God through the cross, through the blood of Jesus, drawing near to you. So it doesn't matter if you are a pastor. It doesn't matter if you attend church every day of your life. It doesn't matter if you voted for Biden or you voted for for Trump or you voted for Mickey Mouse. It doesn't matter the color of your skin. It says here all, all of us, there's no room for pride. There's no room for I'm better than you. There's, There's no room for, you know, I've got this figured out and you don't. All have sinned. All have fallen short of the glory of God. I have no claim on God's gift of salvation. There's nothing I deserve from him. There is nothing I deserve. There's no distinction in the Christian faith. You know, every other religion in the world basically puts works before faith. Do the right things. As Christians, we don't put our faith in ourselves to do good works. No, rather, we put our faith in Jesus, who has done the greatest thing imaginable, given his life upon the cross. You put your faith in yourself, eventually you will fall short. Religion tells you to put your faith in yourself, to do the right thing. The heart of Christianity, however, is to deny yourself. What does Jesus say? Take up your cross and then follow me. The idea that I think I know what is best for my life? No. Reformation is about reorienting my life around the gospel. It goes back to trust. In what do you trust? In whom do you put your trust? In what do you trust? And what we trust is not shown by what we say. You know, we can confess the Apostles' Creed, right? I believe in God the Father. I believe in, in Jesus the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. But, but our faith is shown not so much in, in what we say. Our faith is shown in what we do. Re. Restore. Renew. It means turning around. It means going back, right? When you reply to an email, the message line, right? R-E, colon, and then there's the message. You're going back. It's sending back uh, the message. There's another R-E word that ties in very well today with that idea. It's called repentance. Luther has a way of saying a Christian's whole life is about repentance. Repentance means turning the other direction. It's going the other way. I was going one day way. I was walking in my own steps. I was walking in my own wisdom. I was doing what I thought I knew was best. But I come to understand that, well, there's a better way. And it happens to be in the exact opposite direction that I've always been walking. The Reformation is not so much something new. It was returning to the faith 
of the early church. It was returning to the cross. It was returning to Jesus. You see, in Luther's day, the church had got a bit off track. It had got about, become about things like, well, indulgences. Buying a piece of paper as your get-out-of-jail-free card. But Luther reminded us, the scriptures remind us, that ultimately, Reformation, a new start, a new beginning, is not about something so much new, but something so much very true. Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am abundant new life, and that no one comes to the Father except through me. Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift of the Reformation. Thank you for the gift of new starts. Though we recognize that new starts aren't about something new as much as it is about you. Help us, Lord, to return, to repent, to turn, to come to you uh, humbly and in faith, to reorient our lives fully and completely, trusting in you. In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people said, amen.